Well, good evening, everyone. Um, what I learned, uh, he's always in. He's always in a position of thanksgiving um, to God. He realizes um, what God has done. Well, since his past tense, he realized what God has done. Uh, for him and how God has saved him and you know what he was doing to the um, church and to Jesus Christ personally and he's always thankful he's always grateful um, to God for what he has done and I also learned how an appointment to God's service is is always should always be seen as a service um, which we should such people should always see that appointment uh, from stance of servitude. The perspective should always be, I'm serving the people, I'm serving, I'm a servant of God. And another thing was um, how ignorance um, is not always an excuse to sin, but that God in his mercy, you know, makes a decision between those who make deliberate mistakes who they who don't they know they are making they may not even know they are making a mistake but the their stance is I don't really I don't really care I'm just going to do this and then there are those that sincerely do not know as we see in the case of um Paul who was persecuting the church but he honestly you know didn't know but he was doing it sincerely although this is not a guarantee of mercy from God but God still in his um, grace can make a decision between, you know, I'll show this person mercy because they were not sincerely doing this. They didn't know and they sincerely didn't know. And that um, everything emanates from Christ Jesus, um, everything that we need, there's nothing outside Christ. Everything that God gives us is in Christ Jesus, gifts, the grace of God, eternal life, love, and everything that we can ever hope for is in Christ Jesus. And um, we sh the gospel is about teaching people that Jesus came to save sinners. That is it. It's not, it, we shouldn't um, point people to the law, but to the gospel. The law is, you know, may tell us to try harder or be good, be better, you know, but by the time you are doing one thing, you find out you are lacking in something else. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus came to save and his total reliance on Jesus Christ, us, his mercy in our lives um, daily. We should strive for that mercy and we should point others to that mercy that you can't do it yourself. It is, it is Christ that, that can do it. So go to him, stay in him, um, live in him and... Um, Again, going back to how Paul said he was the foremost of all sinners. And, you know, Paul was not saying he's, he's in sin right now. And he, he meant that I was the worst of all sin. In fact, I was personally fighting God, but God still showed me mercy. And that was really, um, you know, it was, it was really personal for me because it's like, no matter what you are or where you are, God's grace and his patience can reach you um, as a Christian, as children of God. Um, we shouldn't think, oh, this thing is so great. This, ah, can God actually forgive? I mean, if God could forgive and have mercy on Paul, then we should know that the, uh, the patience of Jesus Christ is vast. His, his grace is able to do everything that we, we, we can think of. It's not limited. And that is all that I got from last week's um, Bible study. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Sister Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. You know, in class, in class really, you know, this, um, when one person talks and sort of gives a long summary, and Sister Evelyn just gives, and then the teacher asks, yes, anybody else? You know, uh, you're, you're going to just raise your hand and say, she has said everything. I hope I hope that will not be the case today. So, anybody else in the house? There's lots of us from last week. Yeah, good evening, bro. Peter. Good evening, bro. Hillary. 
right. So basically, two things I can, I, I personally pick from the the three lessons we've learned from um, the book of Timothy so far is that um, uh, Paul stresses the fact that some people were teaching um, wrong wrong doctrines. Um, in First Timothy one five one four, he says not devote not not to devote themselves to meet an endless genealogies which promotes speculation rather than stewardship from god and so these these people were preaching things that are the old testament they were preaching salvation by works in this sense and then paul was trying to tell them that this salvation is a free gift of god's grace okay and that the law is for the righteous is to protect the righteous and the, the law itself is for the, the unjust, okay, and he gave us a vice list to show show that, and also he he encourages Timothy, as we saw in Timothy uh, First Timothy one eighteen. He said, "This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare." Okay, so he was trying to encourage Timothy. So two things: he, he was preaching on stressing on the free gift of grace from God. And also encouraging Timothy to 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 fight with a good conscience and um, and have and faith. These are the two two weapons by which I mean he can she should fight them, and also urging the church to there to respect the words of Timothy. In that sense, so those those two those two words those two things I can take from it. All right, thank you, Brother Hilary. Anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, so I just want to add, I don't know if someone has mentioned it. Um, also the, um, the importance of um, taking it to what God has said, um, instead of listening to your conscience and also what people are saying, it's, imp it's important and it was mentioned um, last, week so i just want to add that too so i come again i didn't get that oh i said that um yes last week too, it was also stressed that we should listen to what god has to say more than listening to our consciences and also listening to people around okay okay thank you all right so i think we can start um thank you everybody um so to, to just go straight to trying to connect it to, uh, sorry, please let me know if you can see my screen and what you're seeing, uh, what exactly you're seeing on my screen. Anybody? First Timothy 2, 1 to 2, and pray for right. all people. Okay, so, um, so for me, uh, I, I, I like from, um, from, from the previous chapter, uh, everything that has been said so far, but uh, what hit me sort of between the eyes is where Paul used himself as a prime example of, of how far God can go to save someone, you know. And he was, you know, the interesting thing about like First Timothy in particular, and uh, I, I believe uh, the pastoral epistles in general, is that Paul wrote them to address certain emergencies in the church, certain things that were going wrong in the church. And other than seeking extra biblical sources, one great way to tell what is going on in the church and what Paul is trying to address is to flip what Paul is saying and you know, to understand his message and try to flip it over. And then you understand what these false teachers uh, were doing. Uh, I think some commentators called it the Ephesian heresy. You know, so, and, and, you know, so in, in looking at Paul's example, you know, like, like one of us has mentioned, I, I think it was Hillary, how that, um, you know, so one of the things they may have been teaching is that uh, salvation, and, and that's the recurring theme throughout here as we see today, salvation was sort of exclusive or sort of restricted or limited to a select few, perhaps just Jews and their proselytes. And, and we'll hear that again and again today. And, uh, you know, but, but from chapter one, I, I surmise that why Paul used such a powerful example of himself 
is to say that, see, that salvation is not for the righteous in the sense that, um, that Christ came. In fact, Christ came to save sinners. That's the context. You know, I believe Christ came to save sinners of which I am chief. All right. So don't restrict uh, this to the noble people, the righteous people, the pious people. The gospel is for everybody. The gospel is to go out for everybody. And God will stop at nothing to get to a sinner and save him. You know, that God can save even the worst sinner. If God can save, you know, like we say, if God can save even the worst of sinners, like Paul, which is the example he was given, God can save anybody. God can save anybody. And, and um, for me, it was a big takeaway because we should have that at the back of our minds. Uh, personally, I get very, very, very discouraged in praying for uh, the salvation of people. I get very discouraged, especially when I see how sinful I'm like, ah, God, I, I almost want to pray and say, Lord, but please don't bother. This one, this one is out of coverage area. <laughs> this one, this one is the lost cause. This one, ah, this one is too much. The sin is too dark. Even me, I can see. You know, but we are never to despair until God says a final no. I believe by taking the person out of this world, we are to keep at it. No matter how twisted the person is, no matter how sinful the person is, no matter how ignorant, no matter how wicked the person is, we can trust God. So nobody is in like, like we believe God is able to, like the scripture says, God is able to save to the uttermost. Nobody is outside of his reach. You know, and it's a big boost for us when we're praying because we have the confidence that, um, you know, that God can save anybody and everybody. So we can pray for anybody and everybody, no matter how dark, even if it's Adolf Hitler of today, and God can reach him, God can save, you know. So it's, it's somewhat in the same line of thought that Paul moves into what we have before us. We're looking at verses, we're discussing verses one to seven today, somewhat. That's a, a similar, definitely similar train of thought. At least the base, the root of both chapters one and two, uh, the root of the discussion here is um, Paul trying to address the Ephesian heresy, the Ephesian problems by the false teachers, you know, and a big part of it, the root of it was that they had a deficient view of salvation, that they were pushing, okay? And it reared its head in different ways and Paul is addressing this. You know, so here in verse one, um, I think uh, we should start, I've forgotten our tradition, for someone to read verse 1 to 7 straight for us. Uh, so anybody who hasn't said anything, please unmute your mic and read for us Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, and then we will we'll look at it verse by verse. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it says, pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, and I'm telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Thank you, Sister Kenna. Thank you. All right, so thanks for reading first. Okay, so, um, so again, uh, the underlying overarching theme, it's in English. All right, so the underlying theme running from chapter one uh, and, and up to here is the matter of this skewed view of salvation that these guys were propagating. And here, you know, at first glance, when you look at this passage, in fact, my own title here says, pray for all people. I think in the, in the last slides, all right. And indeed it's, it's about prayer, but we need to, uh, having the background of what's going on here, you know, in, in our minds will help us you know, more accurately interpret the passage and the verses there as being in the context of salvation, right? And we'll see this as we go on. 
you know, of course, it's good that we take these verses that are uh, talking about public worship and prayer and, and all of that. But the, the root, the moving uh, factor here, the primary factor here is about salvation. So um, verse one says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. You know, so Paul, Paul he's starting this chapter, you know, by talking, he says, first of all, you know, by speaking of something that he considers of primary importance, all right, which is the offering of prayers of all, for all people, you know, and we should note here that he doesn't mean that the first thing, uh, the first order of business that, uh, that must be done every time the church gathers, or we're having a service uh, on the Lord's Day, perhaps, you know, is that we start to offer prayers. That would be a good way to start and I think most church services start that way anyway, any, uh, in any case, you know, but that is not what he's saying here. He's saying that this, um, this duty of praying for the salvation of the whole world is not, you, we shouldn't regard it as something, uh, as something secondary, as something that is not priority, but on the contrary, you should consider it as a big reason, as a major reason why the church gathers. See, a major reason why the church gathers. You know, so, and then um, he goes and he says, first of all, then I urge that supplication, prayers, and all of that. So, so uh, his, his thoughts continue, and then he uses a, a, a Semitic literary device, uh, which is, he wants to say one thing, but then he lists synonyms. I think we do it today, you know. Uh, I can't think of a good example, though. you know. But in those days, there was this flow like that that we got from motivational speakers, where he says something like, "You have to maintain, to sustain, to retain, so that you can attain and obtain uh, what you have." I don't know, you know. So, so basically, it's uh, it's a way of emphasis of emphasizing something from different angles by using synonyms, words that mean practically the same thing. So you're trying to give weight more weight, you know, more shine, you know, draw more attention to your main point. Okay, so it says, first of all, when you gather, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. So, by the way, that, like I said, they're all synonyms, and maybe it would help. Somebody please uh, read, uh, get ready to read for us from Ephesians 6.18. Um, maybe I should call somebody. Sister Kenneth, if you're available, please you, you read for us. Where's that? Our usual readers. Sister Evelyn. Okay. No Efficiency. We'll start paying salary. Efficiency is 18. Okay. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we see that a similar idea, a, a similar mode. Uh, uh, this is not the first time Paul is talking like this. And like I said, it is to underline, you know, verbally or visually, mentally rather, and to communicate as he was writing in the, in the minds of the people he's writing to, that this is my main point. I'm underlining it like one, two, three, four times. So he's using four different words that are synonym, synonyms. Uh, supplication is a form of prayer that simply means, uh, okay, let me just read out my definition here. It says, the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. You know, if you've never done it before, you, you can't relate. <laughs> you know, you've never, I don't know, um, you know, um, what biblical example. Well, like uh, Hebrews talks about the Lord Jesus, that he, he, he prayed and cried aloud and made supplications. You remember him in Gethsemane. And you know how earnest he must have been that night praying and you know, I, 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 and, and that would be a good picture. So you're in that street and you are begging, you know, um, you're as humble as can be, you're on your knees, you know, in fact, on your face, and that is supplication. So where you're asking another party to give you something or do something on your behalf, on behalf of someone else, supplication. Uh, prayer is a solemn request or for help or expression of thanks addressed to God or some other deity. 
um, intercession is doing this, this making this supplication of prayer um, on behalf of another, specifically on behalf of another, is intervening on behalf of another person, on behalf of another group of persons. Um, uh, what, what biblical example again uh, would there be? Moses interceded for the people of Israel after they had sinned, he stood between them and the Lord, and the Lord did not, uh, in answer to his prayer and plea, supplication, answer his supplication, did not wipe out the entire country. Um, you know, so uh, thanksgivings, I think that thing is simply the expression of gratitude, especially to God, of course, in this context, God. You know, so when we give thanks, when we intercede for others, when we pray for ourselves, we make petitions to God, we, we bring uh, supplications you know, to God, um, all of these things are synonymous with prayer. So here Paul is saying, with all kinds of prayer, I want you when you gather, that it's your primary duty, your main duty. And I, I'm sure nobody would miss out on the fact that when the church gathers, that the word must be preached. You know, but who would have thought that prayers, not just prayers in general, but prayers for all people in a salvific sense, you know, was to be a primary reason why we're coming to church. You know, and this is what Paul is hitting at here. You know, he's saying pray for all, uh, uh, this kind of, all these kinds of prayers must be made for all people when you gather. All right, so, and then the emphasis, funny enough, is not even on, all these synonyms that he's using. The emphasis is on all people. Do all of this when you gather as of first importance for all people. So he's making it clear that this great uh, duty of prayer, uh, which is exhorting the Ephesian church to do, is to not be exclusive or limited to any particular group of people. It is not some elitist privilege just to be made for all people, all people. You know, so. Um, in our day, I think it's much more common, thank God, that we do this in our churches and in our prayer meetings and, and services, and, and thank God for that. But back then, what was going on is that the part of the efficient, a major part of the efficient heresy that Paul was tackling here was that they are taught that salvation was restricted to Jews and their proselytes. So uh, if salvation is restricted in this way to this small group of people, but then people what? What's the point? Hello, brother Peter. Yes. Please, can you define what a proselyte is? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so a proselyte is a convert. Basically means a convert. Like, for example, uh, in our day, the two big religions would be Christianity and Islam. If I have a Muslim friend or a Muslim person in my neighborhood who I start to talk to about the gospel, I start to teach about Jesus Christ, I'm making him a proselyte. So if he converts from Islam or paganism or whatever he is, so the word proselyte he speaks to somebody who has converted from one religion to the other. So that's the, the meaning of proselyte. Sorry, thank you for pointing that out. So, um, so and you remember Jesus did use that word in, in one of the gospels where he would talk about the Pharisees, that how that, that uh, they, they can go to the ends of the earth to, uh, to, to uh, just to gain one proselyte. And then when they gain him over to Judaism, they make him twice the son of hell as they themselves are. You know, so it's, it's, it's talking about um, converting people to your own faith, as it were. So, um, so, so, so the interesting thing here, again, I, I'm pointing out, Paul is telling them to do this thing. You can immediately and safely, um, Assume, would I not say assume? You can you can glean from what Paul is asking the church to do, right? He's instructing them to do that. They've not been doing this. They have not been praying for all people. If they've been praying uh, in terms of salvation, yeah, they have probably been restricting it like the false teachers that influenced them to to Jews and proselytes, like they would come to know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here Paul is saying no, that <laughs> that these prayers, all kinds of prayers. In, in this, in, in fact, generally, and also in terms of salvation, must be made for all people. All right. So um, uh, Paul is forcing uh, the scope, is widening the scope of their prayers, you know, uh, to to be global in its outlook and not restricted to um, to Judaism. 
or the Jewish uh, faith and the Jewish people. All right. So and um, and, and and one more thing. So and, and I I love the way that when you look at the, the history or the background of what was going on at the time, you know, you get insights as to how much of a of a when I say dark horse, what's the right word? How revolutionary the Christian faith was, all right, back in their day. Okay. Um, um, you know, so the Christian faith, right from its earliest days, was always Catholic in nature. Catholic, I mean, by Catholic, I mean universal, not Roman Catholic. It was always universal in nature. So Christianity is a universal faith. People from every tribe and tongue. Uh, uh, are welcome, in fact, are, are invited to come to God through Jesus Christ. It is not restricted to the Jews, it's not restricted to Africans, it's not restricted to Gentiles, you know. It's almost seeming beginning to, anyway, this is debatable, but I, I, sometimes I get the impression that we've come uh, almost 180 in the sense that while back in that day, the faith, the Christians then were trying to keep it to themselves, like, you know, keep the Jews out and not bother about, I mean, keep the Gentiles out and not bother about them. You know, uh, sometimes I think that we evangelicals, yes, I think it's evangelicals who are bothered about evangelism, you know, uh, want to keep it Gentile. There's not much going on with regards reaching um, people groups outside of the Gentiles, like reaching uh, Jewish uh, communities. You know, but then that that's very debatable. So, but, but, the Christian faith from inception, as Paul is showing here, was always universal, it was always global. God wants everybody, white, black, tall, short, men, women, boys, girls, Indian, American, everybody to come to Christ. All right, so um, in verse two, we read that, I mean, okay, we have verse two here. In verse two, we read, he says, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, right? So um, <laughs> now, having said that you must pray for all people, the apostle makes it a point of duty to specify that uh, some people in particular that the church are to pray for when they gather, you know, that they must lift up in prayer all kings, that, that's a reference to rulers, governors, uh, commissioners, ministers, emperors, not just uh, literal uh, kings or royalty. For example, they were on that Roman occupation, so that would most likely be referring to their procurators and the Caesars or whoever was emperor at the time. In fact, I think it was Nero who was emperor at this time, and, and that even ties in here nicely. So he says, pray for all of them, all kings and all who are uh, for kings and all who are in high position. You know, so first of all, this shows that from inception also, the Christian faith was never anti-government or anti-civil establishment, never, ever, ever. You know, on the contrary, Paul himself had thought, I think, I, I didn't bring this up, but Romans 13, verses 1 to 7, Sister Evelyn, if you're there, or can I if you're there, um, Romans 13, verse 1, verses 1 to 7, just quickly read for us, please. Everyone must submit to governing authority for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servant sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, but they have the power to punish you. They are God's servant sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what they what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for the long read. So, so basically we see that 
the Christian teaching, the standard teaching, even way back then, you know, was that Christians were to submit themselves even to the Roman authorities. All right, this 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 ran foul of popular feeling, popular thinking, at least amongst the Jews, you know, because they hated the Romans, they hated them with everything they, they had, you know, and um, that would even tell you uh, how how much they went out of their way to get Jesus crucified because, <laughs> you know, um, they hated Jesus way more than they did the Romans, right? They hated him so much that they were okay with the Romans killing him. So that's an aside. You know, so, so Paul's teaching uh, in Romans 13, 1 to 7, that we have to, uh, that Christians back then were to obey the civil authorities and cooperate with them and be in submission to them, you know, was not a popular teaching back then. You know, so it tells you, um, uh, again, how early Christianity must have stood out, you know, uh, compared to popular thought, popular thinking, popular practice back then, and how revolutionary it was. You know, so this, and this was a very bold teaching for a Jewish person to be making, you know, in public. You know, so, um, so the Christian faith was never anti-government or civil establishment up till today. We have to obey the authorities. And, 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 and if you remember, the Jews' hatred and animosity towards the Romans, which is understand, humanly understandable anyway, uh, you know, it, it eventually snowballed into what happened in AD 70. They rebelled. And then after some years, sometime the Romans dispatched armies uh, led by Titus and Vespasian. And then they came and eventually destroyed Jerusalem and even went all the way in AD 73 and 74, and also overthrew Masada, the Jewish fortress there. You know, so, um, so, so this teaching uh, that Paul is uh, alluding to in saying pray for all kings and, and those who are in high positions, very much, is in is in very is very much in line with the, this uh, the standard Christian teaching for us to be in submiss, uh, submission to the authorities back then, you know. So and if if you um, okay, I don't think we need to look at this reference. Okay, so 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 here also remember that Nero uh, was most likely the emperor at this time, and he wasn't a very popular emperor, even with his own people, not. To, uh, that, that they hated, you know, and they were the ones who eventually persecuted the church. In fact, the apostle Paul himself died, uh, most likely uh, in this wave of persecution that broke out under Emperor Nero when he blamed the Christians for starting a fire that destroyed much of uh, the old city of Rome, you know. And, um, you know, but here, here is Paul saying to pray for them, pray for these rulers, lift them up in prayers. And then he doesn't stop there. He thankfully gives us purpose. And I like it. Uh, I like scripture being so plain like this and simple. It says, do this, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Godly and dignified in every way. You know, so um, now, you, how many of us know that even up to today that Whoever is president, ah, no, no, no. If, if as a Nigerian, you don't know now that um, whoever is president or whoever is in government can affect your life, affect your bank account, affect your quality of life, <laughs> affect whether or not you have a job, what kind of job you have, what opportunities you have in life. In fact, affect your religious, your freedom, uh, your religious freedom. Uh, maybe maybe you've, been, you've, you've, you've just crawled out from under a rock. But I, 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 you know, so, um, and the elections in America will also show that uh, recent elections in America will also show that everybody is much more aware, you know, and which is why the people who supported for uh, Trump to get back into office and people who supported for Biden, they all, uh, it was all about their interest. And these two gentlemen who wanted to be president for this term, you know, and their policies, you know, so um, people voted along those lines. And here, Paul is saying, Pray for whoever is there already. Pray that they may make policies that will make your life livable, bearable, possible, stable, all right? And he says that we may live peaceful. The goal for the Christian is that we, ideally, we want to live peaceful, quiet, godly, and dignified lives. We want to have normal lives, all right? So um, I have a reference here I'm looking for. 
Um, okay, so somebody read for me from Second Timothy three twelve. I don't think I brought it up. Second Timothy three twelve. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their yeah. wait. Second Timothy three twelve. Twenty three twelve. Yes. Sorry. There's one of one wife there. All who decide to live of in Christ Jesus will be prosecuted. Sorry, read that again, please. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All right. So, so here Paul is making it clear that see, forget, forget it. Also, in the book of Acts, I think 14, I'm not sure. He says, see, it is through many tribulations that we will enter the kingdom of God. So Paul is not being pacifist with regards to persecution. He's not running away from it. He's not shying away from it, you know. But he's saying, see, we don't go looking for trouble. When we pray, we don't pray, Lord, please bring more persecution. No, we pray for, 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 for normalcy so that we can live out our lives, uh, 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 worship our God, express our faith, you know, with freedom. You know, so the Christian faith is not against, we're not saying that we don't want persecution in the sense that, uh, in, in that in that way. He's saying that ideally we should seek, it should be our ambition to pray and seek for calmness in our lifetime so that we can, we can be able to gather in church. Just look at what COVID did to us. You know, um, assuming it was some kind of persecution or uh, government policy to prevent religious gathering of, I don't know, Christ, that targeting Christianity. And they say, See, you know what, you can no longer gather. Um, you know, we'll have to go into hiding. We'll now have to start switching. We'll go to Bogolay's house this week and then somebody else's house next week and keep it hush hush. You know, so, um, so Paul was saying here that our, our, prim, our prayers, you know, for these guys, that they may be saved, that they may come up with the right policies to the end that, um, their policies may allow us live life, live normal life. And 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 just as an aside, um, so not long after Paul writes First Timothy, the the Nero persecution, the persecution that Nero broke out, and then he himself is is, is beheaded, is arrested, and then killed. You know, I, I I think so. And and the persecution continues. The persecution continues this way and on and off different locations sometimes widespread you know but the church is never truly free up until the fourth century where constantine becomes emperor becomes uh, uh, emperor of the roman empire and then he supposedly just looking he supposedly converts to christianity and and he, he legalizes the religion and all of a sudden uh, christianity is the legal religion recognized is no longer an illicit, illegitimate, illegal religion. Christians can meet in the open. They can buy property to have their churches. They can go and register their churches in CAC and what have you. You know, so that for me is sort of a good example of how government policy can dramatically affect how we live our lives as Christians. And Paul says we pray for them because of this, that we may have this, that this is good, uh, which is what he says in the next verse. It says, this is good, and it is, uh, sorry about uh, the darkness, it's not bad, it's only a thing, but I think I should get to my All right, so this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. You know, so it's, it's, it is good and acceptable that first, all the things he has said so far, that we pray uh, all kinds of prayer for all people at all times, especially for rulers, people in authority, pray for them, cooperate with them, pray that their policies will allow for fairness and justice and openness and freedom, you know, and normalcy and calmness, you know. So, um, and, and here again, Paul is, 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 is refuting the thinking of these false teachers who think that salvation was exclusive and therefore salvific prayers or evangelistic prayers were exclusive, you know, to uh, uh, a few, you know. And um, all right, so, And, and one more thing, it also lines up with Jesus' teaching to pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you. 
you know, to add that. So the Roman guys were not, they were not the most righteous or benevolent people. And here Paul is saying to pray for them. And, and that applies to us even today, you know, regardless of um, when is election time, you can take sides. I don't want Buhari, I want Jonathan. I don't want Biden, I want Trump. I don't want this guy, I want that guy. But when the person becomes president, you know, it becomes our duty formally to be able to pray for them. They're leading like Nigeria, 200 million people, pray for them, pray for that God will guide them in their policy making and, 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 and everything they do. All right, so I have a question here in this evening. Uh, it says, what is meant to be our attitude even when we know that our government is corrupt? I can tell you one thing for sure. <laughs> Don't pray for them to succeed corruption or to become more corrupt. You know, so, um, uh, okay, and why, and why does God still allow these wicked leaders to rule? Hmm, well, um, well, 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 how do I respond to that? How do I respond to that? Well, I think for starters, okay, I have like, for starters, let us recognize that much of, um, much of the Bible speaks of God's future plans where he will have a truly righteous, not wicked government, a truly holy government, a truly godly go government that is led by the Messiah himself. You know, and this is yet future. So between now and then, God permits that we will soon touch on God's will. God permits for sinful, broken, even outrightly wicked men to rule countries, to rule states, and um, and cities. So um, I, I don't know, Deacon, if you have anything to add to that. What is meant to be our attitude, uh, even when we know that our government is corrupt? We, we pray for them that God will guide them. All right, that God will influence them, that in spite of themselves, that they might make policies that are good, that are fair, that are to the benefit of all, and does not restrict uh, freedoms, God-given freedoms, freedom to life, freedom to, uh, you know, all those uh, human rights. Can I say something? Okay. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, I, I, the, the question, I think the answer is also found in the verse two that we are looking at, you know, that we should lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So even in the midst of, you know, the bad government that we, it's not an excuse for us to begin to, you know, change the life which uh, Paul has, you know, stated here, that we should live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness and honesty. So I think that is, that is for me, that is, when she asked that question, that was what ran to me. So I said, let me put that. All right, Dickie, now continue. Uh, if you have something to uh, uh, say about that. What I wanted to say was that there are reasons why God allows evil rulers to rule over us. And not all of them are known to us. But what is known to us and what is foremost is that it's an opportunity for us to pray. And one of the things we can pray for is for God to remove them. It's not, so prayer does not only mean for them to succeed. Uh, obviously we want to have a peaceful life, but we can also pray that God to release, uh, remove them. And my wife also mentioned one that often the rulers, and this is a classical example in Nigeria, are a judgment on us, showing us the quality or lack of, of the nation. So you should always ask yourself in Nigeria why we vote one party out, we vote one person in, and the story is always the same. It's a judgment on us and on our state, our moral state. So many reasons why God allows this. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. So yes, so um, thank you very much for those thoughtful answers. I, my heart brain please. So the, the thing is, um, we can indeed pray for relief. We are not to take up arms and try to physically force our way to fight them. We can pray to God to remove wicked rulers. In fact, the guy who had Jesus crucified, what was his name, Pilate, you know, like two, three years after that incident with Jesus of Nazareth, he gets recalled by Caesar, all right? And guess why? Because he was too wicked. <laughs> you know, so Caesar had heard all kinds of reports about Pilate that, I mean, this guy, you are too brutal. What is going on with you? 
And I'm sure many of the Jews have been praying that, Lord, please remove this wicked man from our land. And, and God heard uh, two or three years after the man was withdrawn and we assigned elsewhere. You know, um, I, I don't know if it would be a good example to mention uh, um, 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 General Sani Abacha. I think he's probably the most notorious of the Nigerian leaders. You know, I was a boy then, but I remember the tension, you know, and, and, and I, even though I didn't understand everything, how life was, you know, under him, you know. And I remember very clearly, in fact, uh, the day he died was my own Isaiah 6 experience, where I, we were in school. If I remember correctly, I, I'm not sure, if I remember correctly, when he died, people rejoiced so much that, I don't know whether, yeah, I think it was in the afternoon, so I don't know whether we had already closed, whether that was why they opened the gates and everybody rushed out, everybody was screaming, practically ran home. I, I already closed school that day. <laughs> I remember. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember as well, sir. Nelson, yeah. yeah. We're went happy. To, we went to the same secondary school, that's true. So I remember mm -hmm. that we went home early. It was like uh, Nigeria winning the World Cup. I saw people, strangers, hugging each other on the streets. I'd never seen that before. People were hugging, people were in tears. Like, you know, they were hugging each other. They were saying all kinds of funny things. Uh, Gary now, one night, or something like that, like, because he's dead now, the price of Gary will become cheaper. You know, little did they know. <laughs> you know, so people were rejoicing. I got home excited. It was, everybody was outside. People were honking their horns. People were sitting outside of their cars. That one guy, you know, died. In fact, the scripture says, um, when the righteous prosper, the people rejoice in, in the book of Proverbs. But when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. You know, so I always tie that scripture, that verse in Proverbs to that event of Abacha. So yes, absolutely. We can pray out um, uh, horrible leaders. But like Dickie Wally said, I think what we should ask ourselves is if we are deserving of those kinds of horrible leaders. Because the one happening in Nigeria Party after party, year after year, decade after decade, that one is there. To me, it's, it's clearly judge, most likely judgment. All right, so moving on to verse four. And uh, it says in, uh, in the ESV, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So the subject in this verse, of course, is God. God is the one who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So um, interestingly, um, this is, I think, a go-to verse for people who have a universalist um, view of salvation, you know, in their, in their theology. And um, oh, what means? Okay, hey, you can only, there's more questions for you here. It says, Gabriela has said that as Christians, should we engage in protests against our government in terms of their policies? I will say yes. You know, however, we cannot be violent we, as much as possible. Should avoid um, um, breaking the law, you know, destroying property, all those kind of things. You know, I don't know. Even the blocking of the road, I think, is a bit too excessive. But we can't protest. Uh, if the deacon has something to say, go ahead. I just want to say that that is not in view in this text, but the answer is yes and no. So yes, in the sense that in our own time, we live in a democracy and we are a constitutional democracy and the constitution of Nigeria allows you to protest. So I don't think there's any disagreement on that. Everybody, we have a constitutional right to protest. Uh, you can. The answer, the other, the no part is the fact that you can do it and something doesn't always mean it's expedient. So it's a question of judgment, question of time, question that is impossible to answer in general, whether should we be protesting, but may God give us wisdom to know when to and when not to. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, coming back to verse four, it says, who desires, God desires oh, all. Yes? Capita. Yes. Okay, sorry, so if yes, if 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 we are allowed, if if we can, but we can only say yes or no. So if yeah. if yes, is there scriptural backing for it? Is there? Can we refer to any scripture to say okay? So this is why we can do this. If yes, 
it's legal. It's legal for you to protest. That's why I said, you know, the law of Nigeria allows you to protest. It's yeah, part of the constitution. I, I, right. I, I think you're asking the question in a Christian context. We know that the constitution allows it. But does the Bible allow it? Does the Bible forbid it? Is that a biblical the Bible cannot forbid it because it's, it is nothing wrong. In, if the Bible cannot forbid something that is not God and it's legal under the law of the land. So the Bible cannot forbid it. What I'm saying is that the Bible is silent on many things and whether or not you should do it is a question of wisdom that cannot, you can't give a general yes or no answer to. You have to be very specific. In this time, is it a wise thing to do? And then if you are meant to protest, how? There are many ways to protest. One way is going on the street. One way is forming an NGO. One way is getting a, a elected to the National Assembly. There are many ways in which you, because all of this is trying to change government policy, but there are many ways to go about changing government policy. That's my point. And the method to be used and how you should go about it, the question of wisdom that nobody can give a, a card blank answer to. All right, thank, thank you very much, sir. Okay, so I I, um, I have a question for us. Oh my God. Okay, yes, yeah, so Uchi has posted something. He said, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Uh, this sort of touches it, but it's not really about protesting in the context we're discussing. It's about uh, standing up for people who cannot stand up for themselves. And we should do that. And I would, I would even go so far as to say, even if it means mass protests, if people are being oppressed, we should speak up. All right. So, um, so yeah, back to verse four. So I said that this verse is a major, is, is probably one of the proof texts for people who are, who are universalists. Universalists are people who believe that, um, that see last, last in the end, everybody will be saved. Everybody will be saved. We we'll all go to heaven. Nobody will go to hell. You know, so my question to us is, do we believe this? Do we believe that this verse teaches that very quickly so we can move on? I don't believe it teaches universalism. I think it just expresses God's desire to have, I mean, in pulling from Ezekiel, I can't remember the exact um, chapter where God was, that wouldn't I rather have the unrighteous repent? So God doesn't want to, would rather that people repent and believe in the truth than people continue in sin and perish. So I think- right. All right, thank you, Kenneth. Anybody else before we continue? I, I think the, state, the statement does not suggest anything, uh, you know, about saving everyone. Uh, I think it suggests that this, okay, hold on. <laughs> that yeah, yeah. It doesn't suggest that God is going to save everyone. Sorry, let me rephrase it. That God okay. is going to save everyone, but He would want everyone to be saved, but not everyone would be saved. I think that is what it actually means. That's is he not God? Uh -uh. If he desires something, what will happen? Is that? If he's God, if he wants something to happen, what would happen? Yes, see, it would happen, but that would be going out of himself to do that. Yeah. But he, he would want all men. If all men is saved, fantastic. But not all men would be saved. I think that is, that is my own understanding of that statement. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, who's there? Can I say something? Yes, go ahead. Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's just like um, like you said, first of all, let's see go from the, the judge aspect. Whenever we bring people or if we go to the law court, we see that judges do not actually have the the, the um joy seeing sentencing someone to death or to prison you know, to any based on the um, offense the person committed. So the judge does not have that desire that, oh, finally you're here, so I'm going to send you to prison. There's no much joy to do that. But however, he or she being the judge, we could affirm that the law states that if you do this, you will get this judgment. The same way that if someone commits a crime, there's some capital offenses where if you commit a crime you have to doesn't mean that the person have that 
um, pleasing desire to do that, except the person doesn't have heart. So that is the first angle of it, where God is expressing that I do not desire for people, or I do not wish for people to go to hell. But however, there are consequences to actions and inactions. So whatever you do, there's a consequence for that. So that doesn't mean that if I pass my judgment, I'm fully happy that you're, you're, you're going to a particular place, but that is what has to be done. Now, the second aspect, yes, one will say he or she, God is God, whatever he desires, he can do it. Yes, uh, God does not just say, okay, today I'm going to create another God because he desires to, to do that or go something outside his will. He has his own, he is controlled by his own standard and his standard is that you do this, you get this. So that's where I'm coming from, that it's not possible for all men to be saved. Not because God cannot uh what will, will not do it god where people those who argue for free will and all that will also come in so that's where i would just end by saying that god is a judge he doesn't have that pleasing desire to sentence people to hell but. all right thank you Hongu. thank you i think it was a good example a good analogy all right so um so um so verse four says god desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth and like i said um People who have who are universalists, they say they, this is one of the places they point to, you know. But I, I think it betrays a, a misunderstanding of the complexity of the will of God, and this is why I'm 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 I'm, I'm very big on Christians learning the doctrines of the church, you know, um, biblical theology, systematic theology, you know, these topics, these issues, you know, so. Um, so we, we can think rightly and coherently about God. You know, so I, I think the mistake is also coming from assuming that God is like us in the sense that we are very simple creatures. <laughs> At the point of me wanting something, trust me, that is my will. If, except it is out of my power or out of my means to get that thing done, I am going to get it done. You know, if I, if I, if I, had, if I had the money to buy myself 10 private jets right now and, and I want it, you can consider it it's as good as done, all right? But it's not the same, it's not exactly the same with God. You know, so theologians uh, make a distinction uh, uh, um, as to three different aspects of the will of God. Now, uh, um, um, so be, be, anyway, before I, I, I get to that, I want us to quickly read a few Bible verses, Sister Kenne and Evelyn, I, I want one brother to join us. Is Thomas not here today? Uh, no, he's not. Um, Brunel saying, if you can read. Let me read King James. Okay, okay, okay. All right, go ahead. So I, I have Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 to 29. I have Daniel 12, 2. Sister, uh, you read Galatians 3, 28 to 29. Sister Evelyn, read Daniel 12, verse 2. Sister Kenne, please read Matthew 25, 36. Okay, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen, amen, thank you. So, so basically what I, 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 I that uh, Bible reference for from Galatians 3 is to say that, is to emphasize that um, what the Bible teaches is that salvation is open to all, and in Christ, all are one, everybody's equal, everybody's welcome, uh, man or woman, and, and that ties in with what we're talking about, and, um, um, you know, and, uh, you know, refutes the, the central thesis of the efficient heresy that was exclusive or elitist. Somebody's raising their hand. So, uh, so Gabriella, please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Um, that verse that was just read, I will, I, I don't fully understand it in in view of um the context of the hierarchy between man and woman. Um, I understand that we're equal and we're one under Christ, but. 
I don't know, should I say how does that tie with the same with submission and um and respect and the I don't know how to try oh, wait. Which which verse? Uh, the part where um, I know what you're saying and I can answer. Okay, please go ahead. Okay. Um it's the one where there's neither male or female and yeah. we're all one and yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there is a difference between equality of people and difference in function. So there are two restrictions, as far as I can tell, that causes the problem. Restriction on church office and uh, roles at home. So the one on church office, is good to remember that the restriction is, is not on women only. The only people who are allowed in church office, or really the only people who, can, uh, who are ordained are men who meet a certain threshold. So when it says women cannot teach, other men cannot teach. Also. So only, indeed, at the end of the day, it's only elders who are meant to teach. So, so the point is, there's a difference between equality, which everybody is equal, but then some people, a very few people at the end of the day, so it's not even the vast majority of men also would not meet the criteria who are given the opportunity to teach the word of God. Doesn't make them less equal. And for the terms of in the home, I really like what C.S. Lewis said about it. C.S. Lewis said, whenever you have an even number, someone has to have the deciding vote. So when he says that the man is the head of the house, what he's saying is that at the end of the day, when the two of you have had the discussion, someone would have to make the final, if the two of you cannot agree, I mean, what is going to be the outcome? One person has to say, okay, we can't agree, but I think this is the best way forward. Now, having said that, always remember that the model of leadership in the church is Christ. And what did Christ say about leadership? He said, he who will be greatest must be least of all, and servant of all. And the greatness in my kingdom is, me is measured by who serves the most. So if a man, whether a man as a husband, whether a man as a pastor, wants to lead in a Christian way, it means a good husband is the one who do more things than the wife, is the one who is asking himself, how am I serving my wife? How am I being lower than my wife to make sure that this family moves ahead? A good pastor, is the one who is saying, how am I working harder than everybody else? Like Paul said, he said, I've worked harder than everybody else. So again, Christian leadership is not about saying, I'm the man of the house. So all of you keep quiet. Christian leadership is saying, I am the one who God has given the responsibility of leadership and it's a burden but I must discharge it because God has given me the responsibility. It's a, it's a very complex topic and I don't want to take you off. So if you want, we can talk about it more, but just because other people might have similar confusions, I wanted to at least clarify that. All right, thank you, Dr. All right. Thank, you, so, thank you so much. <laughs> that helped. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm glad that helped. All right, so so coming back to our, um, I think I need Daniel 12, 2 and Matthew 25 for this read, Sister Evelyn, Sister Kenne, because they refute universal Daniel, Daniel 12, Daniel 12, 2. 12 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Amen, thank you. Matthew 25, 46, Kenneth. Okay, okay. Um, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay, thank you. So uh, these are prophecies from Daniel and Jesus that show that um, that prefigure what is going to happen, you know, in the, uh, in the, in the end, uh, in the time of the end, that some people will be saved while some people will go into eternal doom. All right. So um, universalism doesn't hold up in the face of scripture. However, how do we understand that verse four in First Timothy um, two? So I, I, here's my, here's my take. All right, so I, I, I said that theologians, they, they have a way of, they, 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 they said that they, they recognized three aspects of uh, to God's will, and that I congratulate myself on, on confusing it into four, but I'll just explain what I mean by each of them. But there's original definition. <laughs> All right, so, so God's will of command or decree. So God's will of command is God's sovereign or uh, 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 decree 
or will or decree. Um, it's also called by some theologians God's secret will or hidden will. You know, is that it's the one that reflects well most directly uh, that God is the sovereign ruler of the universe and ordains everything that happens. And when He says something, it will be so. You know, whether or not uh, completely independent of what anybody or anything uh, or anybody anybody does or anything that happens, it must happen. It must be. For example, uh, I think an excellent example of that would be God's command in Genesis: "Let there be light." And there was light. You know, so I, I move on to the next one, uh, God's permissive will. So, um, and this is God's will in a way that it interplays with the supposed free will of his creatures or actions of his creatures, where he allows things to happen or he allows his creatures to do certain things. For example, uh, Joseph's ordeal, um, he permitted for Joseph to be kidnapped and you know, maltreated by his brothers, sold into slavery. He permitted for Joseph to suffer you know, in obscurity. He permitted for Joseph to be uh, maligned and jailed you know, by Potiphar's wife. Uh, he permitted Satan to torment Job. Um, he permitted everything that happened to Jesus. All right? Even though all these other actors and players, these people were doing, uh, uh, they were, they were doing what was in their hearts. You know? You know, so, um, so God permitted all of this, even though he wasn't pleased by he's not he wasn't pleased by what Satan was doing to Job. He wasn't pleased by Joseph's ordeal. But we see that he permits these things ultimately to bring about some much greater good. All right. So God permits it, and it's not without purpose. God's permissive will, you know, eventually leads to uh, something that God wants to happen in the future. You know. So, and this does not mean that the people who who, uh, uh, who perpetrates evil, you know, under God's permissive will, are not held accountable. They are going to be held accountable. In fact, in Mark 14, 21, uh, Jesus said, he said, the Son of Man goes as it is. It's prophesied about him. <laughs> but woe to, I think we're talking about Judas, woe to uh, 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 this guy, I forget how he puts it now. He says, it's he, uh, you know, so it was better that he were not born. Okay, so um, the third would be God's revealed or prescriptive will, right? And this is this would be what we call scripture. Uh, this would be God thundering out of uh, Sinai to dictate the Ten Commandments: You shall not kill, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. You know, this is God's revealed will, all right? And we are held accountable, even though we have the ability to obey it or not obey it, to break it or keep it, right? Um, we, are, we, we don't have the right to do so. We will be held accountable eventually when we break God's revealed will. Okay, so God's prescriptive will is binding even though it's not forced upon us in the immediate. Then there is also what I term God's dispositional will. It's probably the same as God's permissive will, but here's what I mean. God's dispositional will is the attitude or desire you know, for something that he's pleased by or is displeased by. Um, it is his bent, his inclination, you know, I'm copying for and racking up synonyms, his mindset, his predisposition, his frame of mind or heart's desire on a matter, even though he doesn't stretch out his hand to do it, to force it, or give the command for what he wants to be done. He, uh, it, it is his heart's desire, but he allows for uh, 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 something otherwise perhaps to happen. So, um, so now how, how do I uh, tie this in with verse 4? I believe what is going on here in verse 4 is God's permissive or dispositional will in the sense that even though he would prefer for everybody, every single human being to be saved, he doesn't command it. At least that verse doesn't say he does. All it tells us is that he desires for all men to be saved. So I, I want someone to read for us from Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Any one of our readers? Ezekiel 33, verse 11. I didn't put this up. Either. Uh. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel, 
Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give for me. Oh, is that right? Can you read that again? Ezekiel 33, verse 7. Verse 11. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from the evil ways. For why will, for why will you die, O house of Israel? All right, thank you very much, Kenneth. So here we see that God, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He sends his prophets to warn them, he, he reveals his word to guide them, but then uh, they either obey or disobey their salvation or their destruction as it were. You know, so uh, this is God's uh, dispositional will. He doesn't wish for any, even the wicked to die or to be lost, but that they come to salvation. But he, scripture does not teach that he has commanded this. If God commanded the salvation of all men, believe me, it would happen. All right, so, but, but that's not our topic for today. You know, so uh, moving on. So this statement by Paul for me was his headshot. You know, when they are, maybe we watch action movies and they are shooting and they're shooting and this guy is not dying and he's shooting here, he's shooting here and he's not dying. Then you hear the policeman or the actor who they, they go for headshots. They are wearing vests or something. And then one shot in the head and the person is quiet. <laughs> All right. So this is Paul's headshot at the Ephesian heretics position, which stated that salvation in Christ uh, was, was exclusive to the of, of Jews and their converts. But Paul is here saying that, no, that thesis is false. God desires for everyone to be saved. The offer of salvation is open to everybody. So if God desires for everybody to be saved, um, why, why will you not pray for everybody, especially secular rulers and people in authority, no matter how unpopular they are? You, know, you pray for them that they do right and, and um, that your lives are posit posit positively impacted by this. All right, so uh, moving on. So he also says, and that they come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, reading verse 4, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, so while, while salvation is the ultimate goal in view here, you know, coming to a knowledge of the truth is the way to it or synonymous with it. You know, um, um, if can someone read for us from Titus chapter 1 verse 1? I don't know if I pulled that up. Ready? Titus 1 1, very quickly. From the Paul is seventh. Is it, did you say Titus one one? Yes. Paul is servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. All right. So a knowledge of the truth is um, is an equivalent of accepting the gospel message. You're knowing the truth. You know, like Jesus says, "I am the truth." You know, coming to know the truth, to accept the truth, um, which uh, Paul is using as a reference here to mean that all that God has done for us in Christ and through Christ, you know, is, is, is synonymous of salvation. So he's talking about them coming to know the truth in terms of them not just having academic knowledge or mental assent to the fact of Jesus' life and the teaching about it, but to believe in it. Okay, um, I see... Okay, I'm saying something here. Will something that God has permitted be punished by him? Oh, of course. I said that, uh, for example, um, um, the Holocaust, the, the, the German Nazi party led by Hitler, in the slaughtering millions of people, some of their own people who were sick and, and deformed or disabled, uh, six million Jews, and lots of people that they felt were not of the supreme race, you know, it will definitely be, God, God permitted, God allowed it to happen, all right, in his permissive will, but that does not excuse Hitler and those guys of murder, you know, same thing with the guys uh, that betrayed and had Jesus uh, Yes, in fact, all sin falling into this category, all sin that God allows to happen, has allowed to happen, you know, giving people the chance to obey his word or to not obey his word, and then they all choose, or we all choose rather, 
to not obey. He permits it to happen, but then what the scripture teaches that one day he is going to hold everybody accountable by the man he has killed in Jesus Christ. Okay, so, um, so moving on. So verse five says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. So uh, the, this phrase, for there is one God, you know, uh, reminds, you should remind any Jewish person of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4, you know, where it says, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And, um, and how, what does this have to do in this context? It is a major reason for offering prayer for all people because there is only one God. There is not one God for the Jews and then one God for the Gentiles, or one God for the Jews, one God for the Romans, one God for the Greeks, one God for the Americans. There is one God over all. All right. So, and if salvation uh, has been offered, you know, uh, uh, is only to be found in that one God, then that is the only hope that all people have. And if that is the only hope that all people have in our prayers, in our evangelistic efforts, we must be inclusive. We must be inclusive. All right. So the father is the father of all this. In fact, Paul uh, himself uh, says in Acts 17.26, all right, uh, that God has made all the human race of one blood, all right, and, and definitely we must have the interest at heart of all human beings. We cannot uh, be sectarian, like this uh, Ephesian heretics, but uh, it has the interest of all people at heart. And in fact, if you go back in the, even though God chose Israel out of the nations, his plan was through Israel that all the nations would be blessed. That was always his plan. Going back all the way back, the Messiah's mission was always global. I don't know how the Jews missed it. It was always global. All right. So uh, there is one God and there is one mediator. So, and, and then uh, Paul is uh, probably making this point about Jesus being a mediator. Uh, the book of Hebrews describes it at length, you know, as against Moses, you know, because the Jews thought highly of Moses and to him, he was their mediator. You know, between them and God. But Paul is saying here, yeah, Moses is not the mediator between God and men. Jesus Christ is. And if there is only one God, there is only one mediator. It is only through this one God and through this one mediator that all men, Romans, everybody can be saved. So, and um, this has to reflect in your prayers. This has to reflect in your prayers. You know, he's saying to these people. You know, so, um, and, and we should also mention here that the, the, the Roman Catholic Church is teaching of having Mary as co-mediatrix with Jesus Christ is completely false. It is completely baseless as, as far as the scripture goes. I mean, even Moses has a better chance of being co-mediatrix with Christ than Mary does. Also, but scripture is very clear. No one clear terms it says here and everywhere else that Jesus Christ is the one single mediator between God and all human beings, not just the Jews. So any prayers made to or through Mary uh, people putting their hopes in her to speak to, I don't know how to do it, to speak to Christ and then on their behalf and then Christ to speak to God on their behalf, you know, is, is actually idolatry. All right. So, and then he says, the man, Christ Jesus. So, um, so Jesus was truly and properly, fully a man, having a perfect human body and so on and all of that. And um, uh, Paul's point, Paul is not saying here, that this would probably be a go-to text for people who want to say that Jesus is only a man. No, that is not what he's saying here. But he is in this context saying that, uh, in, this, in the context of salvation, that Jesus' is, um, Jesus is, uh, ministry for us as a mediator is, uh, we should think about it in terms of him being a man because it's to our favor that the mediator is one of us, all right? A high priest who has uh, experienced our weaknesses and knows all our weaknesses and is able to represent us perfectly like the book of Hebrews teaches. So it doesn't prove, he's not saying here that Christ was not also divine, you know, because everywhere else, um, even Paul himself, John directly tell us that the son, uh, that the word became flesh and the word was God, you know, and Paul himself says also in Romans that he, he the Lord Jesus Christ, is God over all. So here he's saying the man Jesus Christ, our representative, is gone into the heavens and is standing there as our intercessor. 
um, moving on to verse six, he says, who gave himself, still talking about this one mediator, subject has shifted, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Once again, you can see that back and front, up and down, left and right, Paul is repeating his main point, which is to say that the scope of the salvation of God in Christ is for all. It's for all. It's not just for the Jews. It's for all. It's for all peoples. All right. And this is the reason why, as you're praying in your salvific prayers, your prayers also should be for all and not be restricted, not be limited. Okay, so, um, and then he says, uh, he gave himself as a ransom for all. So a ransom, I think we know what it means, unfortunately for us in Nigeria now, because uh, kidnapping has become, uh, it's, uh, you know, a business, you know, God help us. And um, we know that the people who escape it, who do escape it, like you never, almost never hear that they just escape or they are rescued by the police, but the ransom is paid, it's money paid. In those days when a king or a country, they fight and they take captives, you want to get your people back, you have to pay a ton of money, you know, and it's called a ransom. So Jesus Christ was, um, Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for us. He gave himself, you know, as payment for our sins to buy us back, uh, back to God as it were. And then um, there's a statement here it says, which is the testimony, um, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Um, so there are many different explanations of this phrase, but my take is that it directly ties to um, what has been talking about the subject there, about Jesus being the mediator, the man Christ Jesus being the mediator who gave himself as a ransom for us. And that this act, this singular act that he did happened at the right time as a testament to God fulfilling his age long promise, you know, of birthing salvation, of bringing salvation, you know, um, of causing righteousness and praise to spread throughout all the earth. You know, that this was a testimony given at the right time. So there, there are lots of uh, other references that um, allude to this, but for time's sake, uh, I'll, I'll skip them. So um, coming finally to verse seven. So Paul says here that for this, for this sake, for I, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. So this is Paul's final argument in urging or exhorting the Ephesian church to pray for all people. He says, see your, your, your position doesn't make any sense. Because this is the people you're excluding, the Gentiles you're excluding, are the ones to whom I was sent. They are the ones for whom Jesus Christ called me and made me an apostle. All right? So you cannot exclude them. All right? So they not just exist. They are a major part of God's plan. They are, um, they are part of God's salvation design, God's uh, strategy, if you'd like. And we must not only preach for them, we must pray also for them, all right? And, um, and, and I, I have scripture references here to show about Paul being a preacher and an apostle, but I think Deacon Wale, uh, uh, when we started out, did uh, talk about what it means for Paul to be an apostle. It just means to be an ambassador or an emissary, or, uh, you know, and in this context, a preacher, a herald, you know, like the town crier that comes to uh, wake you up every morning you know, so Paul was ordained by Christ with a specific mission to reach out to the Gentiles. And he says, I speak the truth in Christ and why not? You know, so he's solemnly appealing to them, you know, in the form of an oath, right? To underline, to, to emphasize, you know, the importance of this. I am telling you the truth. I was sent by the Lord to reach out to these Gentiles who were excluding. And, um, and he says, in faith and verity, you know, so, um, to contrary to the false teachers who are teaching falsehood, Paul is, 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 is affirming to, to, to the Ephesian church that I am telling you the truth. I'm teaching you, I'm teaching the Gentiles true Christian faith. All right, the Gentiles are included. And how many of us will remember Acts 10 and 11, where the Apostle Peter, 
So we're talking about this issue about the Gentiles being included in God's plan of salvation. Being included in how, how that the Apostle Peter saw the, the uh, had the kill and eat vision, and then uh, the men come and get at the gate to tell him that Cornelius is, uh, has sent for him. And then the Holy Spirit tells him to go with those men. I have sent them. And when he goes there, still confused as to what is going on. You know, how can the Spirit of God send me to the Gentiles' house? And then when he gets there and uh, he speaks to Cornelius, he makes the statement. He says, Now I know that uh, God has poured out his Spirit upon the Gentiles. And in Acts 11, he's explaining the situation because the brethren accused him when he came back. Ah, you enter the Gentiles' house. And he says, See, that this is what happened. That I know that God has called people, anybody from anywhere who obeys his word, who heeds the call of the gospel, that God accepts him. You know, and, and, and then the brethren said, okay, if God has given salvation to the Gentiles, who are we? And, they, and then they receive him and they celebrate. Okay. So once again, uh, the large context here is um, that of salvation. You know, and in fact, the prayers here are uh, about praying for the salvation of these people, not just prayers in general, praying for the salvation of the Gentile people, especially rulers. And I, I gave the example of Constantine, only God knows who, you know, most historians take his conversion with a pinch of salt. I do too, because he had a vision and, you know, and, and all of that that helps him win a battle. So, um, but for the sake of this discussion, let us assume that he did become converted. You can see the flip, the immediate flip he made after 300 years of the church being an illegal religion, hated and despised by everybody, all the pagans. In fact, even the Jews, their religion was recognized by the Romans, by the way, their worship of Yahweh. So they are infighting, they are, they are what's the word, fratricide. They are, they are fighting the, the conflict between the early Christian church and the wider Jewish community who were not Christian, you know, made the Christian church a target because if, if even your Jewish guys are rejecting you. That means you guys are, are really ominous. You, are, um, you know, so after 300 years of all that suffering, the emperor becomes a Christian and boom, Christianity is all of a sudden a legal religion. They can worship freely in the open. In fact, I, I listened to one church history lecture where uh, the, the teacher was saying that it was after that time that the church really, really had time to sit down and start doing theology. Of course, we had people like Augustine and other early church fathers before Constantine who had done theology, but men, uh, not at the scale, you know, at which the church massively started to do theology, came out, started to build uh, cathedrals, you know, came out in the open, it was now cool, it was no longer a death sentence to be a Christian, you know, so uh, the Christian faith sort of exploded in terms of numbers and, and, and spread, you know, after, uh, government policy change in our favor, you know, in that regard. Of course, it had some disadvantages, but that's not perfect. You know, so, um, um, what, what, are, what is our take home today? So, uh, in chapter one, we saw that Paul first excommunicated two of the ring leaders of these people, and then he gives uh, Timothy a series of instructions, some of which we were looking at already, and we'll still look at others on how uh, the church should be run. Um, and then Paul is here hitting at the root of the efficient problem, uh, you know, which is a bad theology about salvation. <clears throat> I forget that word now, theology about salvation. Okay, so um, it was limited in its scope and that was a big problem for Paul. It was worth addressing. And um, um, so, so, not only did they consider salvation, in fact, because they considered salvation exclusive, their prayers also were exclusive, were limited in scope. You know, so uh, Paul was attacking that problem. And then also Paul enjoins them to approach God with all kinds of prayers, you know, especially for salvation to be made on behalf of everyone, even the wicked rulers. You know that God would influence their policy so that their lives and their uh, practice of their faith would be better. And uh, you know, so that that's the end of it. So that they might live in peace and, and tranquility with reverence and dignity and godliness. You know, not because 
we're afraid of persecution, but to avoid <clears throat> unnecessary conflict, you know, and so that they might have a good witness, a good reputation amongst non-Christians. So um, I, I think one of uh, uh, another one of our takeaways that we also be not limited in scope. How would we limit scope uh, today in our praying and in our evangelism? Uh, like I started out, I'd I'd say with, with regards to really, you know, there are some people, you know, um, maybe maybe it's me who is not so pious, you know, who are they are so far out, so lost among the lost, they are especially lost that you know sometimes we doubt that even God is able to reach them. But God is able to reach everyone and anyone, no matter how, as long as the person is still alive. Uh, no matter how ignorant the person is, that you might think that ah, this person doesn't understand English, might not understand the gospel, and all of that. You know, so God is able to reach everyone. Let's pray with that confidence. Let's keep it wide open uh, and not re uh, restrict it to, to any one group. And, um, and let's also consider that a direct implication of this passage might be, might be that we should take uh, evangelistic prayers much more seriously, all right, much more seriously. You know, we pray a lot, uh, in my church we do, in fact, we pray a whole lot, um, you know, but uh, it should be a major feature of our praying to remember people in prayer with regards to their salvation, you know, that they be converted, that the Lord will reach out to them, you know, and particularly, you know, those of us who are of the Calvinist persuasion who believe in the sovereignty of God over everything, including salvation, you know, we should pray more than everybody else. Pray more. We should um, pray so so much more. We should we should we should we should spend a lot of time on our knees and with our hands lifted up in prayer before God over people. Name them, rulers, people we know personally, people in our our, our, our acquaintances, our friends, our family members. Rulers, name them and say, Lord, this person is not safe. You know, they, they, you know and, and it will be us tackling the root of the problem as well. You can pray till you're blue in the face for somebody to get things right, to get policies right, to get life decisions right. But I find that uh, a lot of the times when a person becomes safe, right, it solves a lot of problems. It, it has, a, it has a, a domino effect on everything else. You know, so um, we should have such an outlook, even when praying for our political leaders today, okay, that God will influence their decisions at the national level, at the state level, and what have you. And um, of course, we should pray for our religious leaders as well, that God will guide them, and God will influence them, and lead them by the hand, you know, to do their work well, because if they do their work well, they're the ones who are benefiting from it. To teach well, to teach faithfully, to lead well, to lead wisely. Be good examples to us, you know, to, to, to uh, you know, so we, we shouldn't neglect to pray for everybody as well. So, um, thank you. That will be all for me. Questions, comments. Um, Rapita, thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 go ahead. Okay, so um, the last verse, verse seven, it says, for this I was, I was, sorry, for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. Now in my Bible, ESV version, he has in parentheses, I am telling the truth, I am not lying. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the word of um, Apostle Paul is, is truth, is scripture. And um, I just wonder why it was, saying that he was not lying because in Matthew 5 uh, Christ said yes or yes be yes and let you know be no so there's any, any particular reason why he was stressing that he's, he's saying the truth because up, up, up until now he's saying the truth I would believe it so why was there need for the parentheses well, yes so like I started out by saying that um you you see it you need to the background why well, one of the reasons why it's good to do all these studies right is that you you actually don't understand for example in this case you uh, First Timothy chapter two verses one to seven. You read it a thousand times before. You don't understand it fully really well until you understand what was actually going on. All right, there is a story to it. There's a background to it. There's a context to it. 
So the true meaning of these verses and everything can only be gleaned when you understand what was going on. So, uh, for example, now you believe the Apostle Paul. In fact, you believe he's an apostle. Some of the people in the Ephesian church probably were questioning his apostleship. This is why in chapter one, he starts out by identifying himself as an apostle. And you see elsewhere, he's defending his apostleship, I think to the Corinthians, and you know, and, and saying that, see, that I perform the signs of an apostle with all patience and power and everything uh, with miracles and signs and wonders. Why does he have to uh, reel out his credentials to these people? Because not everybody there um, were recognizing his authority. If not the way it is with us today. All right, so that's one point. Then, secondly, yes, Jesus did say that let your yes be yes, and you know, you know, don't swear by heaven or by earth. I don't see Paul swearing by heaven or by earth here. He's simply saying, I'm telling the truth, I am not lying. He's emphasizing that I am, he's telling the truth. And I think Jesus himself did that when you say something like, very, very, I say unto you, I say, I, I say to you, that kind of thing. It was a literary device to underscore something important or very true that the person should pay attention to. That's how I see it. I don't think he's swearing uh, you know, by anything, like uh, which was what Jesus was teaching against. He used to swear by Baal, swear by the temple, swear by the mountain, swear by their mother and father, swear by whatever their left leg. You know, but that's not what Paul is doing here. He's saying, I am telling the truth. He's making, he's appealing to yeah. them. It's an like emotional, passionate appeal. And I'm not lying. Please listen to me. I was appointed for this purpose. Mm. Mm. I was, it was in parentheses, nothing, nothing more really. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Okay. In the absence Sorry. of further questions. Okay, go ahead. Who's there? Yeah, when, let's say like, when you're praying for people to be saved, is it okay to like have an expectation that they will be saved? Of course. Why would you want to pray? You know, you want to pray like like the early church did when they were praying for after James had been had been uh, uh, killed by Herod, and the people were pleased. And the scripture says that he then arrested Peter also and was planning to kill him. You know, and the church that were praying, when God sent an angel to bring Peter out and Peter got to the house where they were gathered and praying, <laughs> you know, they, uh, well, at least the girl who opened the door, you know, I couldn't believe her eyes and all of that. They thought it was Peter's ghost and all. You know, so yes, you should expect when you pray that God will answer your prayers. In fact, coincidentally, yesterday in church, uh, uh, the title of our sermon, uh, Pastor Tony, was... Um, I think God answers prayers, if I'm right, or something to that effect. So yes, God does answer prayers. If we believe that, then how it manifests itself when we pray is that we, we believe and are confident that He's hearing us as we're praying and, and that He will grant what we ask. Even though there's a caveat, you know, that it is not everything we ask of God that He will grant. Even things that are in the world, He might not grant. But our general disposition, whenever we pray, in fact, we don't expect the no until we see a no. We expect the yes all the way, especially something like salvation that you know for a fact that God desires all men to be saved. You know for a fact that He wants people to be saved rather than go to perdition. So let's pray and keep praying. You know, I, I like um, David's attitude after he had done, done the unthinkable with Bathsheba. And the baby was born out of that adulterous relationship. And um, God, uh, in judgment, was, had laid his hands on the baby to take the baby away. And how that David, you know, tore, took off his royal clothes, humbled himself and, himself and prayed with full expectation that God would raise the baby, that God would spare the baby. But eventually, God did not spare the baby. The baby died. And... Uh, David, when he found out, immediately got up, cleaned himself up, and went to go and eat and drink. You know, the Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. You know, so I, I think our disposition is to pray until God says the category found me. You know, um, I don't know if that helps. Um, um, sorry, I understand what you are saying. I just wanted to, should we expect or should we hope? 
um, if I heard that right, you said that should we expect or should we hope? Hope, yes. Well, in the definition of hope, I think the word expect is implied. Maybe let me Google it up. <laughs> you know, so maybe we're. Uh, Yeah, so hope is defined as a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. And that's what I'm saying. And let us be expectant. Let us, you, you shouldn't be praying for something that you really don't expect to happen or you really don't desire to happen, you know? So, um, so really that's what I'm hitting at. Yes, thank you, Humphrey. Yes, more questions, more comments. Everybody's been so quiet. Well, most of us. Okay, in the absence of any further questions or comments, let's take our hymn. And who's going to pray for us? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Brother Nelson, if you're there, please. Please pray for us. Please close us in prayer. Um, I'm going to stop recording.